morning, everybody. Welcome to our show, The Paranormal Rangers. Uh, Andrew, I'm going to let you take that over for a moment. Welcome, 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 everyone, to another native <laughs> Crossroads podcast. <laughs> Hey, we are joined by our usual suspects, the Paranormal Rangers, plus the lady Laura Massey, myself, Andrew Bartz. Today, we are going to be talking about cryptids and the lore of the Thunderbird. Jonathan, Stan, Michelle, welcome to your advanced intergalactic podcast. Today, let's get into the nuts and bolts of what are cryptids. What well, is the lore of the Thunderbolt? And we encourage everybody that is watching and the chat room to go on and type your questions in. This is an interactive podcast. So, Jonathan, what is the lore of cryptids and the lore of the Thunderbolt? Let's start there. Well, the uh, the idea of the Thunderbirds is a very, very large bird that was here in the past. Uh, it's, it was said that when it flapped its wings, it was so large that it would create the sound of thunder and that, uh, it would shoot lightning, uh, out of its eyes. So there was a lot of, uh, uh, native lore about that. What's interesting is that you, you have this, uh, native lore that's all over the, what today we call the continental United States and even in Canada. So there's a story that just keeps going and going and going and spreads. Um, so today uh, we call it a cryptid uh, because there are still reports of giant birds uh, that are out there um, that people see from time to time. Sorry, I had to get my mute undone there. It's a giant birds. And some of these giant birds have, uh, have been seen in, in pictographic artwork um, all over the Americas. And is the Thunderbird something just that North American? Uh, the Thunderbird is something that's found in Mexico uh, and, and South America. It's found in uh, Canada and the, the First Nations up there. Uh, everybody has some reference to it. Well, I think... So, sorry. I would like to add that, um, you know, if you go back into um, previous eras, back into uh, paleo times and things, you know, we had... We had the pterodactyls and things of that nature that uh, we know existed here on this planet. And uh, there's fossilized evidence of these kind of things. Um, I think I've seen one version of that in uh, Australia, something that had a 20 foot wingspan. This was fossilized evidence. And uh, so I think you know, today we, like John said, we still have people that are uh, witnessing uh, these these uh, these animals or these uh, things uh, at different times. John and I know of individuals that work with uh, the Navajo Nation's uh, natural resource that that allegedly witnessed this thing firsthand and. Uh, but I think, you know, for me and I think for John, having investigated all different types of what was referred to as paranormal or supernatural, that um, the consensus was that there is somehow a connection with inner dimensions and or multiple dimensions and the crossover from previous times. Um, things being seen such as things like bigfoot you know we're talking about cryptids so things like bigfoot uh, that may exist in other dimensions that is crossing over into our physical world in real time and then crossing back over but but the the thunderbirds 
isn't the only thing that John and I have heard over the years uh, of different types of, um, you know, things that would basically be referred to as under the dinosaur umbrella. So uh, it's very interesting, you know, that people see these things. It's really interesting in the Pacific Northwest with the tribes up there in the First Nations, they they talk about their legends of these mythical uh, cryptids. And what they're talking about, these giant thunderbirds, is they were so large that they could lift a whale out of the ocean. With They had sharp teeth and talons, sharp talons, and were just giant. And so... You know, we could look at that being as a prehistoric type of bird, you know, a pterodactyl or whatever you want to interpret that. But that was a sacred bird to them because it provided protection for their clans and, and tribes. That's one of the lures of the Thunderbird. Even up into the late 1860s and even into the 1870s, there were all sorts of... Um references to children being stolen from backyards, giant birds being said, similar to what the pterodactyl was. And, you know, maybe this this is one of those lures that has just gone on and on and on through history. And then you have the, the condor from the Andes Mountains, which is gigantic. Okay? It's, it easily has a 16, 18-foot wingspan. And, you know, there could easily be things in the sky, just like things in the ocean that we've never seen. Um, well, they're also talked about where they would they would ride ahead of the thunderstorms as one of the reasons they were called the Thunderbirds. They would uh, ride the heat wave being pushed forward. You know, it's interesting you would talk about the condors. Um, they are now considered an extinct species. And the last, I when I saw a condor was in Northern California when I lived there in the early 80s. And now they regard them as an extinct species. And it's really interesting how that can easily happen within our own lifetime. Yep. So do Thunderbirds um, appear in the Navajo stories? Oh yes, yes, they definitely do. Um, we have uh, uh, icon of, uh, uh, icons that are done today in jewelry and, and other uh, types of, of uh, media uh, that celebrate the Thunderbird. So uh, in Navajo lore, uh, the Thunderbird brings rain and uh, is, is seen as, a, as one of the, the things that are just out there. And um, we've had quite a number uh, in my time with the Rangers, and I'm sure Stan has, we've had many reports of <laughs> giant birds. Um, and, and I'll just start off with one real quick. Uh, I, I had worked on uh, an area called Newlands, which were, were the uh, uh, relocatees from, from the Hopi Reservation were being shipped to. Uh, they were relocated uh, many times against their will uh, because of our government. And uh, when they were put down on these new lands south of uh, Sanders, Arizona, uh, they were given these houses with uh, modern day plumbing and electricity. And they just said, here you go. Here's your house. And they put people down there. They had no idea that. Electricity costs money, plumbing costs money, water costs money, and now they're saddled with all these bills and they had no idea how any of this stuff, you know, happened. Um, but I was approached when I was working down in that area by ranchers who said that they were out herding sheep and they were getting really upset because they said on a pretty regular basis, these giant birds would come down and snatch an adult sheep and haul it into the air and disappear with it. And they wanted to shoot these things. Well, at first, I just assume, oh, they're talking about eagles because we do have a good population of eagles. However, it's been my experience that adult eagles cannot pick up an adult sheep. They're too heavy. 
they usually uh, go after the lambs. And those, they, they can take it just for a short distance and kill it and then feed on it uh, on the ground. So uh, for them to be picking up adult sheep is uh, mystifying to me. And uh, I would give them the same line that, no, you, you know, you can't shoot at it because it's, um, it's protected. Uh, because we didn't want people shooting eagles if, if there were eagles in that area, just on the, on the idea that that's what was taking their livestock. But uh, again, over and over, I heard reports of large birds taking adult uh, sheep that, uh, that are pretty heavy and uh, making adult off with sheep them. Around, around 80, 90 pounds. Right. When the California condor began making a comeback um, early in my career, I know that I witnessed what I, I'm pretty sure was a California condor mm -hmm. over on the west side of the reservation. And I had heard that through other law enforcement, there were sightings of these condors in and around the Grand Canyon region. Uh, so this for a time may have been uh what what the individuals were seeing and uh i don't know about the presence today what it what it is like if if there's still california condors in the region or whatever but. uh yeah there there are uh they're mainly centered around that marble canyon area and the pariah plateau and um they were relocated there uh i actually got to see about a dozen of them uh, sitting on the ground on a raft trip down through the Grand Canyon. And uh, it was amazing because these huge, uh, what looked like black birds were sitting off to the side. And every one of them, on the, they had a big plastic tag that was attached to their wing. And, uh, you know, I took pictures of them. Uh, it was upsetting because I went on a 15-day raft trip uh it was required i had to go stan went on a another raft trip himself so we were made to to go on these trips you know it was just horrible and uh going through the rapids and eating gourmet food every night and uh, camp <laughs> and, and camping out which we hate to do and um I took three of these uh, uh, cameras with me, the, these throwaway cameras that, that you buy at the store. Back then they were 35 millimeter. And I took pictures. I turned them in to have them processed. And when I went to pick up the pictures, they said, oh, we lost two of the cameras. And we only found one that had your pictures on it. Boy, you talked about being upset. And, and then, of course, they say, well, we'll give you another camera. You know, trip of a lifetime gone down the drain because uh, they lost my, my, my film. But, uh, but, yeah, I can actually say I saw about a dozen uh, condors. Were you ever sent on any special investigations for Thunderbirds? Sightings or... Well, uh, Stan can verify this story because he was there when, when the officer was telling us. Um, we had an officer come in, uh, a ranger, and he was telling us that uh, he had witnessed a large bird between Gallup and Grants, New Mexico, um, to the north, uh, which would put it on the Navajo Reservation. And he said this thing was riding the thermals and circling as it as it went toward the north. His description was that this bird had at least a 40-foot wingspan. And he actually stopped his vehicle and observed it for quite a while until it went out of sight. Um, that officer uh, had a background in wildlife biology. Uh, courses in college and was only a few credits away from his uh, degree. And um, so he actually knew what he was talking about when he told us. And um, the thing the, the thing that I remember about that conversation 
was his excitement and amazement uh, that he actually saw something like that. And uh, we just kind of like, well, yeah, you know, that's our reservation. We got all kinds of strange things going on. And, and you know, what's one more? You know, you're talking about birds with large, large um, wingspans. When I was in sixth grade, I'd gone to visit my uncle in California. He lived in Chatsworth, California. Mm -hmm. And the one memorable thing I remember from this, this trip, uh, other than Disneyland, is we saw this bird with a giant wingspan. And my guesstimation, it was like a 16, 18 foot wingspan. And when I came back and I said, what did you do for your summer? I went to California and I saw a bird with a giant wingspan. And no one believed me. They, they, no birds can have that kind of giant wingspan. And then we learned about the condors, et cetera, et cetera. And all of these sightings with birds with giant 40 plus 40 foot wingspan, a bird with a 40 foot wingspan could probably live up, lift up a Volkswagen bug. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but you have to remember, you also seen a giant rodent with these big ears and <laughs> on that same trip. <laughs> Tell us about that. No, I said you seen that. It did. Oh, no, no, I did. Yes, I saw my, uh, At Disneyland. Yes. <laughs> oh, that giant rat over there. <laughs> well, cryptids are a really interesting subject matter because we can go back and you know do some of these, you know, Jurassic era era type of cryptoids. Do they still exist in our world today? Uh, because of the site, you know, we talked about my multi-dimensional streams that they could be coming in and out of, you know, um, you know, alternate worlds, uh, realms. And so it's interesting that they can still be cited. Um, there are accounts up in the, um, Antarctic that they see these giant types of, uh, cryptids and also dinosaurs and other things that, that have existed on the earth before. Who's to know what, what this is and, you know, and stories that are being told, not only from the Native American perspective, um, but also from other cultures. Yeah. And, I think uh, John can relate a story about an individual seeing a giant rabbit, um, along the, what was known as Highway 666 at that time. Now it's Highway 491, but I think John can maybe elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, I had a young lady approach me and she said that she was driving north of Gallup on, uh, then it was triple uh, six. Uh, so every, of course everybody called it the devil's highway. Um, <laughs> It actually had a, a sad reputation of having a lot of people die on it. Mm. That was because back in those days, they it was a two-lane highway with uh, one lane going each direction. Right. So if there was somebody slow in front of you, you had to uh, figure out a way to pass them. Uh, the road was had very little shoulder on it, so there was no place to bail out. And uh, and there's a lot of people that were drinking or taking drugs or whatever. And so there were a lot of head on collisions and a lot of people died. Uh, I had family members that uh, that died on that road uh, in the past. And now they're, they've widened it. They're actually making it uh, a divided highway. And uh, but during that time, this young lady approached me and she said that she had witnessed uh, as she was getting up uh, past Yatahe, uh, New Mexico, uh, where the ter road turns to uh, State Route 264 and it goes to Window Rock. She said that off of the, the right side as she was driving north, which is the, the lane right, you know, it's right next to her vehicle. Within the right-of-way fence, she could see giant rabbits that were the size of cars hopping alongside her vehicle as she was driving. <laughs> and she kept looking at them and kind of, uh, you know, getting freaked out a little bit. 
And she thought, is it because I'm, you know, it's two in the morning and I'm tired? What's going on? Am I hallucinating? You know, uh, she, she doesn't, she didn't take any drugs. Uh, you know, there, there, she doesn't drink or at the time she doesn't, maybe afterwards she did, but, uh, <laughs> you know, she was just completely dumbfounded. And I remember her telling me this story and you could see the fear that she had because I think she was afraid that I was going to turn around and, uh, and make fun of her. And when I didn't, then she would continue with the story, but she'd kind of pause every now and then like gauging, uh, what I was going to say or, or, you know, think about it. And, um, and then the story finally came out like that. So uh, I can't imagine what it would look like to have a rabbit, a bunch of rabbits running alongside your vehicle that are hopping up and down and, and uh, looking, you know, the size of a vehicle. Uh, pretty, pretty weird. And there have been other stories of large rabbits too, throughout my career, hearing here and there across the reservation of people seeing things like this. So when you guys get, hear the stories, you, do you investigate the situation? Are there prints left behind? Um, when you, are they just past stories of their experiences? Uh, to be honest, most of the stories come to us uh, later. Okay. Uh, sometime after the incident or even years after the incident occurred. And there's no way to uh, go back and verify. Although I did have a young lady that uh, uh, had a, um, uh, if, if you watch the Netflix episode of Unsolved Mysteries about the Paranormal Rangers, her story is included in there. And she had seen a large rabbit that's not included in that story uh, when she got home. And she said this thing was uh, three and a half to four feet tall. Um, it, it was sitting up like a cat would sit. And she said it had black eyes and it didn't move. It had it, uh, basically uh, pepper like fur uh, colored. It was, um, it, 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 she knows the difference between a jackrabbit and a cottontail, which are the two predominant species out here. And she said this had no distinct markings of any kind. It was uh, completely uh, pepper colored, you know, with, with uh, black and brown fur. And um, she said it just sat there and looked at her uh, after the investigation went through, uh, we found out that there were marks on the ground that were recorded and, and photographed and everything else. And the uh, amazing thing about this case is that the ground is caliche clay that's dried and sunbaked. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like ceramic. And you can take a boot and kick it and kick it and kick it. And you finally break the surface. These tracks that were there were impressed and the surface was cracked where this thing was supposedly sitting. And, um, you know, what I did is I went back later on and put a flashlight on the ground. Uh, so I got contrast and photographed these things and they're a part of the case file. Uh, so there definitely was something there. Uh, she just remembers as she pulled up, uh, her statement was, oh, I'm on to you, rabbit. And she said it never moved. But she, imagine you parking about four feet away from this thing. It's uh, 1.30 in the morning. And you're easing your door open and then backing away from it and running around the back side of the car to get inside the house. And, um, you know, it, it was probably terrifying for her. And, um, so that, that's another, uh, large animal that we see out here. 
Are there, there any, um, loca- sorry, Andrew, locations on the reservation that have repetitive sightings? Uh, not really. They just seem to be all around. And mm-hmm. while I'm at it, uh, there have been a, a, some messages coming up, and I want to address those. Uh, the first one is, have tribal reservations sold their lands to the United Nations? Uh, not that I know of. Um, you know, we, we are not in the business of selling land. Uh, land to uh, transfer land takes an act of Congress. Uh, so even say when the tribe agreed with the National Park Service to elevation marks of Lake Powell, uh, those were not legally binding because it was never uh, codified in Congress. And so, you know, we claimed the, the half of that river uh, along the uh, Colorado River and, and uh, the shoreline along Lake Powell. Uh, are tribal reservations allowing illegals onto their reservations? Well, again, you know, without getting into all the politics of illegal immigration, <laughs> uh, there are people that uh, you have to understand that Tohono Odom tribe, the Pimas, the Papagos have tri- uh, tribal lands that uh, are all along the, the southern border. And uh, illegals are constantly drifting through the southern border all along there. They're even coming, going up through Canada and coming down through there. So there's, uh, there's that constant influx, uh, especially of drug meals carrying uh, packets of drugs uh, through into the United States and, and meeting people on the other side. Uh, and then the last one, uh, can you speak on tribes that have sold your lands to foreign enemies? Uh, well, in a lot of cases, we <laughs> were not willing participants in the sales. Uh, sometimes lands were sold out from under them by other people. And uh, our joke now, um, because we... You know, when you're faced with generational trauma, you tend to combat it with humor. Uh, lately, they said the land of lakes, butter, land o lakes, uh, butter uh, company has uh, taken the Indian maiden off the cover of their butter packet. Uh, the picture of her, she she had a little feather sticking up on the back of her head, and uh, so she's not there anymore, and. We laugh about it because we say, have you noticed that they got rid of the Indians, but they kept the land? So so you can look at a land of lakes butter and uh, and realize that they uh, they kicked the Indian off the land and and kept the land. But the other thing thing with uh, members of tribal members, you don't own the land. Mm-mm. The land is held in trust by the U.S. government, so it's trust land. It's not that a person or individual can up and decide, "Oh, I want to sell my land and to to a foreign entity or whatever." You can't do that. Uh, it's held in trust, and there are areas where you have checkerboard land, uh, predominantly on the eastern side of the Navajo Reservation, right. where there is actual private land. Uh, allotments and uh, private land and those individuals are that own those parcels of land are able to actually sell the land so it's a little bit different but it's only in that specific area and in a small region of the reservation well there are reservations up in the uh, uinta basin too that are checkered board because of the homestead act of that time Right. right. Uh, also, also think- just so everybody knows, there was a process originally of allotting land, especially mm-hmm. in Oklahoma. And this is where you get that uh, the Osage Murders movie from. Yeah. Um, this happened a lot. There were uh, Native Americans that were basically bullied off their lands. Uh, they were they got them drunk and had them sign deeds, uh, signing their lands away 
or they were murdered. And um, the the land was allotted, and then this land was subdivided amongst families, and then sub subdivided. Um, but the the Navajo Nation uh, they did something real smart. They uh, they had the land held in trust. So my house, I don't own the land on it. I signed a 99 year lease to uh, be able to, to stay on it. And that paperwork took 10 years to go through and uh, because of all the bureaucracy. But uh, uh, I have a house and uh, it's, it's on a little a one acre plot of land and, uh, uh, but I don't own it. Uh, the the government held, holds it in trust, so uh, yeah, the the land was not sold to uh, to our enemies by any means, um, and you know, and it gets into a whole another history that uh, that we don't have time to address in in this podcast. But thank you for your question. Also, hey, Jonathan. What's really interesting about you is even Native Americans today who have not had ancestral lineages there can get land. Like, for example, if I wanted to go for my ancestral lands uh, 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 where you are, I couldn't get that permit. I couldn't get a one acre plot. Um, like you said, it took you 10 years. It probably took me never to get that because I was raised not on the reservation. Um, so that's the distinction between people who have been in their ancestral lands, who have lived there for centuries. Why Jonathan got that particular permit is because of his genealogy. Even though my ancestral lands are there too, I couldn't get a permit to this day. From what I understand, a tribal member can apply for these uh, home sites that are currently open within certain chapters i and john could correct me with that but that's what i've heard uh, yeah 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 my and, family has already tried and we've been denied right usually you have to get permission from the people that are living around that area right uh, the trick i've seen is that a lot of natives will build their houses by relatives houses within you can build within a quarter mile of a relative's house and not require a permit for that um, so you'll see on the navajo uh, little groups of houses uh, that are all kind of clustered together and you know immediately that that's that's uh, an extended family so one thing i want to add is there there is a very big uh, sovereign citizen movement throughout many of the tribal lands to get that stuff out of trust. And unfortunately, the sovereign citizen movement didn't do a very good job at it. And in fact, probably made it much more difficult for anybody to get their lands out of the trust. Um, and I know it's, it's common uh, amongst many tribes to go onto that journey, but ultimately you have groups all over the country, including Canada, trying to get their stuff out of trust and it's not going to happen anytime soon. That's why they do these 99 year leases and you have such a massive bureaucratic red tape to go through. Ultimately, they're trying to preserve the lands for whatever unique purpose they've got going on that we all don't know about. Yeah, so no, I haven't heard of uh, any tribes uh, selling off lands to foreign uh, enemies. Uh, so we'll close off that section. Meanwhile, back at the ranch. Uh, <laughs> so, are there any lore? Any lore about giant rabbits in the in the native traditions, and other than what you guys have just talked about in history's past? Uh, yeah. Uh, so here, here's what's really interesting. There was a Native American Navajo friend that I have, and he was a former chief of the Navajo tribe. He was saying sometimes the medicine man would use these particular animals um, for travel, you know, and, and that goes back to the lore of the uh, SWR is what I call it. 
the, we don't say that on 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 our broadcast. <laughs> um, they, 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 the skin changers. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. Shifter. Shifters. Thank you. Night shifter. Yeah, and so uh, so the, in in some of those lures that you're speaking of to Andrew is yes, they used to use that type of animal for for travel. Now I've heard I've ever heard it about the giant rabbit, um, but other animals were used for that time time travel aspect and such so you know i don't know what people are seeing um i'm kind of being the devil's advocate here because i'm saying is you know we don't know or been in those meetings with our our, our tribal you know medicine men and so we don't know what form they take in their travels <clears throat> i think i'd be using a cheetah skin or <laughs> <laughs> or something that could travel pretty quick. <laughs> Maybe a bird. <laughs> yeah, a bird. Maybe a giant thunderbird, right? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but we haven't seen it in our lifetime. But these guys get reports while they were, you know, rangers on the on the reservation. So it's probably fascinating to you guys because you guys probably I don't know if you ever witnessed one. I I, I don't want to assume here, but you know, I certainly haven't. I've seen giant eagles, but I but that's about it. And a well, I do know, I do know on part of the Navajo reservation, there is fossilized ruins of T Rex and other uh, uh, types of dinosaurs that existed at one one point or another. And there's places you can actually visit out near Tuba City and actually see those and uh, be right there where these things existed. And so I think, you know, this can kind of open the door if with your imagination of these other things that once existed, once roamed these lands that we walk upon today. It's almost like, you know, we today, we walk among the ruins of the other peoples that have been there. The Fremont peoples, the Anasazi, um, a basket maker, you know, they were once on these lands. And today we walk among those areas where they lived and, and had communities and things like that. So, and we see the evidence of that, uh, maybe with spirit activity or hauntings or things like things of that nature. Well, why wouldn't you have these things that existed like a, a T-Rex or, or Velociraptor or whatever uh, that once existed? You know, it was a living thing. It had it had a life to it. And it, I would I dare say, you know, what we perceive as a, a soul or core energy, uh, a life force that that being that creature had. And uh, so I, and that might be, it might be stretching it, but you know, I just recently read a story the other day about in regards to CERN or the Large Hadron Collider and where this person was alleging that they had opened up gateways, uh, dimensional portals that allow uh, UAP or UFO activity uh, to and from uh, some type of portal. Well, why can't you have uh, where you have these being? You know, John and I traveled to Scotland one time and the, we heard the talk about Loch Ness Monster and things of that nature. Well, uh, animals, mammals, you know, existed like that at one time. Who's to say that these things don't come and go through some type of time gate, you know? Uh, to or our world, navigate, or just navigate through the many layers of reality. Right, they have their own way, like an echolocation. Some other exactly. version of it allows them to go through portals, exactly, or, or through frequency and vibration. You know, through yeah, multiple dimensions. Yeah. Well, there is an interesting uh, story that I interviewed for with a friend of mine. Um, uh, Junior Hicks's wife, and I, I will say this, that she, 
had one of those uh, moments on her land up in the Uinta Basin on her farm where a portal opened up. And uh, for four hours, it was like, she said, it was like a jungle. And she sat there and I said, why didn't you go through? She goes, I was just too afraid. And, uh, but she said it was like another time period, like of the dinosaurs, big, huge ferns. And she didn't see any type of animal, but she said the dimension, it was so beautiful that she wanted to go through of that particular era. But she said, uh, because she was in fear of she wouldn't be able to come back, it would, the gate would close on her. So that was an interesting, you know, interview that I had with her. And, you know, what's really also interesting is our cultures depict these through our dancing, the eagle dance, um, the Pueblos have their own version of their bird dances and such. And so historically speaking, people don't understand. They just think we're dancing and we revere the eagle. But this could be a part of it, too, if we were to ask maybe one of the medicine men, you know, what's really behind that? And that I want to throw this out there for you guys. You know, John is uh, very familiar in communicating with somebody that had done remote viewing. And uh, so what if the people that can do remote viewing, what if they can go forward and backward through, uh, through time? You know, we think of time in a linear uh, way you know, from the past to in the future, but what if, you know? Mm -hmm. And then why certain people, you know, do they, like you talked about frequency and vibration, are those people vibrating at that frequency so things open up to them? Is that part of the key to the gateway? It could be as well as DNA giving you access to the capacity to travel through portals, much like the various cryptids that have the ability to go from one dimension to another. It can be a built-in innate skill inside your DNA, transversing the multiverse. And it is a multiverse we live in, layered and stacked atop on each other. And could it also be something that was set up as part of your soul's um, agenda before you came in? Certain, that too. Mm -hmm. Or you could just be an explorer of the many dimensions. And it's not about what you came mm -hmm. in for. It's what can you discover? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot to ponder. I'm always intrigued by our, our titles that we bring onto the show because it explores to our minds to speculate. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying speculate but I'd like to bring more fact more to the show and we can do that in the future as to some of these reports of people seeing these particular things or maybe bringing on the people who've had these type of experiences. Well, sure I say you'd be hard pressed to find a family throughout the world that has not had some type of paranormal or supernatural experience. But right. The same goes for the sightings of these cryptids, too. I think there are people that see a lot of things in their lifetime, but but in order to maintain their sanity or or not being ridiculed, they don't talk about it to other other individuals, you know. I'm curious, is there any lore about any aquatic species or fish that are cryptids? You know, in the, in the early 1800s, the alligator gar was considered the bane of existence until they pretty much harvested it through all the lakes and rivers because it would regularly eat children <laughs> that were next to the water. I do know I met uh, a couple of non-natives on the San Juan River one time um, in and where the, uh, the, the Utes have land in that region. It's up in that area, but it's along the San Juan River. Uh, it's called Paiute Farms. When I first came on, the area of Paiute Farms uh, near the uh, Copper Canyon and San Juan River, it flowed through there and it, there was a large body of water. Toward the end of my career, there was only a trickle of water that, that flowed through that area. and. It was probably impacted by the droughts, but I had contacted this 
non-native uh, two men who were in uh, a large fishing boat and they they were wide-eyed and and they were still in that state of shock or trauma at the point that I contacted them and asked to see their fishing licenses. And they said they had hooked on to something that was pulling their boat sideways and it was about to capsize their boat and they were pretty freaked out. And this was no small boat. This was, this was a boat that was bigger than the Rangers uh, low boat that we had. I think that was 17 foot, wasn't it, John? Yeah, the, 17. Yeah. Theirs was bigger than that, and, and it was pulling their boat sideways. Wow. Wow. Crazy. I think that'd be huge. So um, I've did some research back. Um, the Snake River um, would go all the way through, and this would be 1840, 1850, into 1860, and they'd put these giant chain lines into the water mm -hmm. because – fish they were pulling out were a thousand to a thousand five hundred pounds on a regular basis and they'd be putting in two to three hundred chain lines in every day i do know an individual who once said that um he had worked in lake powell and had uh he was working on the the uh the navo generating station when they were preparing it to to get it up and running and he would go into a page in the evening and he was talking to these divers that had, there had been an incident where a slab of the rock had fell onto an elderly couple that was fishing and it took them down. So they were trying to recover the remains. And he asked them, he's talking to this diver and he says, did you go out today and, uh, you know, diving to find them? Did you find them? No, we didn't find them. He said, you're going back out tomorrow? And he said, hell no, I ain't going back down there. He said, I come across a catfish today that could have swallowed me whole. So he yep. said, I ain't going back down there. Yeah. Well, up here in Utah, we have a lake called Bear Lake, and it's up in Garden City, Utah. And there's the lore of the Bear Lake monster. And there's actually a boat, right, you know, where they cut it out is looking like the Loch Ness monster. And kids can ride on that, but apparently the lore is, and there, and it was a Native American lore up there. Um, but I think it's the Blackfeet Indian that lives up there, and um, basically this monster lives in the caverns because Bear Lake is extremely deep, and there's a lot of caverns. In fact, they can't even touch bottom. So mm -hmm. that that's another lore of having a huge monster from the dinosaur area that has come mm -hmm. out. Another another thing is many of these high mountain lakes, middle up middle desert lakes, etc. They have deep underground channels and tunnels that go to the underground water basin, and fish can easily travel through that that area. Okay, from one place to another, and they're all interwoven and interconnected from the top of the Rockies to the bottom of the Sierra Madres. You know, so there's a massive underground you know, water highway for them to go around. And yes, water table levels do make a difference, but ultimately it's going to be food source, food source, food source. Mm -hmm. Okay. And hey, John, don't yeah. you have a, don't you have a contact or with uh, an individual that was saying they seen a small like raptor type of thing on the reservation, some type of dinosaur? Uh, yeah. We had reports at one time up in the uh, San Juan uh, River area in Utah uh, that was part of the reservation up there uh, of uh, people that were reporting uh, what they said were looked like uh, small dinosaurs about three feet tall that looked like a small Tyrannosaurus Rex uh, picture. And uh, they said that these were all in a group and uh, they, they were kind of freaked out about it. And just they said that this happened years before and were telling me about it. So we get so we occasional do. reports like that. And just so, you know, my own personal experience, we've me and Stan have both had reports over a lot of years that there are uh, giant snakes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you would think, well, maybe a, a 
a boa constrictor, you know, got loose somebody's pet or whatever. Um, I have personally witnessed a 15 foot snake uh, crawling across the road uh, on a dirt road that, that could handle two vehicles passing side by side. And it stretched from one end of the road to the other end of the road. And I identified it as a bull snake. Mm -hmm. Now, Stan will tell you that in the past, he's actually seen me pick up rattlesnakes and move them uh, from their location to somewhere where they could go on and, and keep living uh, instead of killing them. And um, I would not get out of my truck to try to go uh, look at this snake close up. Uh, he, I just let him go right in front of my truck and watched him in amazement. And he went into uh, a crack in the rocks and disappeared. And, uh, you know, for me, I used to pick up bull snakes and uh, hold them and leave my truck open. Because when you're, when you're out hiking, looking at archaeological sites, you don't want anyone to be busting your windows. But if you leave the windows up uh, in 100 plus degree temperature, you're going to come back to an oven. And so I would leave my windows cracked and I would put a bull snake on the seat and let it soak up the sun. And most Navajos wouldn't think about uh, opening that door. <laughs> um, so that was my, my alarm. Um, I, you know, I would not pick that snake up. I would not even try to catch it. And, you know, I might shoot it, but I don't want to shoot it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, and we've had a lot of people, we've had people report spiders that would cover a dinner plate and uh, that they shot with a 22. And uh, so there's what, lots and lots of. Uh, what about scorpions? Uh, scorpions. Cryptids, cryptid sightings are cryptid to scorpions type. We haven't had it. I mean, the, We've seen seen them get you know eight inches, eight inches long or so, ten inches long when their tail is laid out. Uh, Stan's been stung by them. Uh, I came close uh, mm -hmm. to getting stung by them, um, but uh, no, uh, we haven't had any reports of giant. Some of the uh, some of the veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan <clears throat> talk about a cryptid scorpion. Um, that's the size of like a Rottweiler. Holy About cow. 25 pounds, yeah. I, and they would travel and hunt in groups. I would not discount those type of stories. Uh, I have personally seen a rat the size of a dog, a, a small dog. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, you know, it, it was, I saw it on, on an abandoned building uh, running along the top of the wall. And, uh, at first, I thought, is you know, what is that? Is you know, that couldn't be a cat, it's way, way bigger than a cat. And, um, but what, what I find most interesting is that when you see things like this, even your, your own people won't believe you. Um, I have seen a black uh, jaguar, uh down near which will which well uh out in the boonies toward uh, zuni and i was patrolling out there and i saw this huge black cat jumping through the brush and um it was just like like it was hopping it was just jumping up and down like this you know trying to catch something and as i watched i i noticed that the black fur that it had the black coat had shiny spots all over it and the tail that went back was a long tail and it had a tuft of hair on the back of it and I immediately reported that to the wildlife biologist uh, with game and fish uh, up for the tribe they turned around they said there are no jaguars in this area they're they're down in southern Arizona and Mexico right right I just and, saw a video uh, the other day that talked about jaguar and puma all throughout the southwestern United States. 
and right. then they actually have game trail footage of them, not one, two, but dozens of game trail footages of them. So there right. is absolute proof that they exist, exactly what you just described. Well, they've been I, I, up in the Black Hills uh, mountains up there yeah. in yeah, the northeastern part of the, the state. But it's really interesting because I think sometimes there are species probably with DNA that they have extra DNA that makes them large because I used to have a row of uh, evergreens, like huge trees that grew up on my lane. And one evening, my daughter went out and she was going to go somewhere. And this giant ghost style spider about the size of her windshield landed right on her windshield. Ugh. And she screamed and she was some, for some weird reason, you know, she was kind of having these spider experiences, but that one freaked her out the most. We've since cut down those trees, you know, due to hazardous reasons. Uh, but it, you know, those kind of things I often wonder is their DNA being told to grow that big, you know, cause you get anomalous things that happen or could it been a, you know, I said a vortex kind of thing. You know, we never know. We never here, know. Here, here's a strange story. Um, I actually was watching a Joe Rogan episode, I don't know, five, six months ago. And they had this uh, guy on there that would go to Africa and regularly look for big animals. And there were a group of lions that got trapped onto an island. Mm -hmm. um, they learned how to swim. And they ate alligators. They, they learned how to hunt. But because they had so much food, they were double the size of all the other lions that were out there. Okay, And then their offspring, who figured out how to swim, got off the island, continued on that journey of being oversized. And then there's the story of the original black African lion, which was double the size of any existing lion that was out there. And, um, you know, it would be like in the 1,500 pound, 2,000 pound lion, you know, you know, nose to tail, like 17 feet, giant, giant in a predator. You could never stop and it would hunt elephants. So their environment is such a vast thing. What do those giant things got to eat? Okay. Exactly. exactly. Well, I right. think, you know, there's, there's, um, there has been discoveries of uh, human humanoid remains that are giants, yep. you know, and yep. throughout the world. And so, if that is possible, then why wouldn't there why wouldn't there be a possibility of of these animal forms that that are giants too, and still in you know coming through dimensions, coming to where we see them at times. Oh, how about chupacadras? Is that am I saying that correctly? Chupacabra. Uh huh. There's another lore and legend. I've had a friend who has actually seen one, and she called me up in Hawaii, and she was said I ran down the road screaming because you know um, I was out walking on my lane, and then she says when I saw this unusual animal that was, had no hair on it because I thought at first it was a sick dog, an animal. And then she said it growled at her and she ran like the Dickens and got in her house. So she felt like that was one of those beings. Mm -hmm. John and I have good friends that live down in Tucson mm -hmm. and they have horses down there. And every now and then they'll have something coming to their corral area that leaves these really odd tracks that aren't something that's identifiable with mm -hmm. the other wildlife. It's a big world out there. You never know what's there. That's True. right. There, there's yeah. just, there's so much we don't understand. You know, we here we are, you know, sending probes out in space and everything else <laughs> and sending, sending craft to the moon. And we only know about Three percent of what's in the oceans, and and that's by our own scientists' admission that we only know three percent of what's under the water, and yet you know we think we've got it all. We we know everything. Mm -hmm. uh, Delusions of grandeur. <laughs> yeah, right. I got a exactly. question from a friend of mine. What, Andrew? 
Any suggestions about putting out trail? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah. I got a question from a friend that has texted me. Any suggestions at putting out webcams? Uh, oh, sorry, not webcams, trail cams, and trying to uh, capture cryptids? He believes that they can smell the webcam or se sense the camera ahead of time, and that's why a lot of the trail cams don't actually pick up any real footage. Well, if they put out infrared light. Yeah. So yeah, uh, there's a possibility that whatever it is that you're trying to capture an image of, might be capable of seeing that bright IR light and it causing it to not come around or whatever. And the other thing there is that we have a scent on us yep. that animals can distinguish. And, you know, a, a good hunter, a deer hunter will tell you, you know, don't ever get, uh, you know, you always try to get, uh, you know, on the other side of the wind so that the animal can't pick you up. Uh, old Navajo hunters would, uh, you know, not only smudge themselves before a hunt, but they would drink, uh, you know, tea that was, uh, that was actually made out of sage. Mm -hmm. And uh, that way it would be in their body. And if they sweat, it would smell like sage. Uh, and some hunters use like pheromones and stuff like that to mask the human scent, you know, when they're going out deer hunting or whatever. Yeah. I, you know, Stan will tell you, I'm, I'm a trout fisherman and, and my, my unofficial name is dances with trout. And, um, when I go fishing, the first thing I'll do is I'll, the first, you know, I'll get in the water, put my hands in the water pick up some mud or some sand and rub my hands and get that scent off my hands uh, before I go fishing. Right. And right. So, you know, there, there's always those considerations uh, to have uh, when you're setting out trail cams. But like Stan said, you know, they, we think that they can see infrared, uh, you know, and, and our vision, it's, it's so narrow. We, we can't see into the X-ray spectrum. We can't see into the infrared spectrum, um, not without uh, other tools that, that you have to look through. Well, it's really interesting. I have a friend who has put webcams on theirs up in the Uinta Basin. They have a home in one of the canyons up there. And hers has caught an actual uh, species of beings, alien beings. And they've also caught uh, infrared camera pictures of a uh, mountain lion, a huge mountain lion come on onto their property. And uh, they were on an episode of uh, one of the, the network shows out there that's going to air here soon. Um, but it was really interesting to see that species of entities. And, you know, one time I, I will get the photo and ask permission to show it on our show when we kind of talk about maybe we can have a show on webcami. Um, but they have caught some very unusual things with the webcam. So I always said, yeah, yeah, you do that. Use them. Well, I think there's things that are occurring all the time in our environment. A lot of times we're not there to see it or to observe it. Right. You know, there's things in our sky. And if we were using different types of infrared filters and things like that, we might be able to capture some of that. We've seen recently during the eclipse, you have all these people running around with special uh, goggles and lenses and cameras and stuff. And some people are alleging they captured, you know, different things that are in our atmosphere or in the sky. And mm -hmm. I think that's possible. If you look at some of, uh, some of the footage from some of the things captured down in Mexico, of different orbs and stuff that are in the sky, different objects. I think that's in our atmosphere all the time. But just like John said, our vision is so narrow and limited that a lot of it, you can't see it. An interesting subject matter. Hey, uh, Laura, we're coming to the top of the hour. Uh, would you like to... Uh, let the audience know what's coming up in York. 
Absolutely, sure. So from the uh, 6th, 6th of June, we are all going to be in York. So we'll have two days where there's a sacred feminine package. And then we're going to have four days of the Paranormal Rangers. So if you don't know about it, listen up, because these three guys are going to be there, Michelle, Jonathan and Stan. And they'll be hosting a seminar for two days. It's training in the, in the hotel in York and then two days in the field, because part of what you get if you come on this package is you get some freebies, some equipment that you can use like uh name me some of the equipment you're going to get we're going to give them guys Help you'll have out. an nice. emp emp uh electromagnetic uh device that can read electromagnetic frequency yeah that's meter. a lot of times it's used by people that are doing different types of investigation yeah so and you'll you also you'll get, get a night vision goggles uh, to see in the dark, a thermal camera to be able to uh, uh, see things in heat gradients, and also a, um, uh, what do cam. they call that thing? Body cam. A body cam. And this body cam records in 4K ultra high definition. Yeah, so, video and audio. Uh, so and you get to take see. it home with you. And yes, yeah, you get to take all these home with you. Just so everybody knows, uh, between Stan, uh, Michelle, and myself, we have a uh, combined um, investigation experience of about 60 years. And uh, me and Stan have, you know, Michelle's got six years of investigations that she's done, uh, me and Stan, uh, just the paranormal stuff, have 22 years of combine experience. So uh, we know what we're talking about. And also they get a, they get it, they get to order a watch from that's been invented by Dr. Sagala. It's a watch that registers electromagnetic fields. So that's kind of the bonus. If the one thing I would say, is don't wait till the last minute to jump on that because you'll you'll miss out. So if you're really interested in it, I would look into it right now and take care of what you need to. Absolutely. We would love yeah. to have you. Yeah, it's going to be a phenomenal four days because part of that, the two days in the field is a couple of nights in York with deathly dark tours going around some very ancient buildings. So you'll be able to use your equipment there. So. Yeah, we're really looking forward to that. So anyone who wants to sign up, uh, probably the quickest way is email me, Laura Two Feathers with the number two at gmail.com. If you want to read more about it, then look up uh, twofeathersmedicine.com forward slash combined healings. Or just just get in, in, in touch with me or the Paranormal Rangers and we can let you know what's going on. Thanks, Michelle. You're welcome. Thank you, Laura. Thanks, everybody, for being on today. We also want to thank our audience for who makes this happen. And uh, we'll see you next week. Andrew, would you like anything to say? This was a really fun show. I have so much fun every time I'm on with you guys. I can't wait to the next one. I want to say thank you to everybody that joined us. Yeah, great. Have a great day. Yeah. Thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye, -bye.